Hello, and welcome to Best Story Wins, a column five podcast where we have in-depth conversations with some of the best and brightest from the world of content marketing. I'm your host, Josh Ritchie, and I'm here with my co-host and column five co-founder, Jason Lenko. Hello. Today, our guest is Keith Messick, the CMO of LaunchDarkly, one of the most interesting growth stage companies around. Hey, Keith, thanks for joining us today. How's it going? Thanks for having me. I was hoping you would intro me as uh, the best and brightest, but it's fine. It's fine. Like yeah. me personally, not just some of the best and brightest, but it's fine. That's good. So um, CMO of LaunchDarkly. So uh, what would you say you do around here? Um, <laughs> around there? A lot. Around there? Um, you know, I mean, my team is all in about 100 people. Wow. Um, I have the BDR and SDR org, uh, inbound, outbound BDR orgs as well. So that adds. Um, but I mean, honestly, like, you know, LaunchDarkly is a feature management uh, software platform in the developer space. It's a category we built uh, and a category we sort of dominate at the, at the moment. And we sort of need to keep that up. But um, so we think a lot about in the marketing role is like, how do we sort of support the bottoms up affinity that we have naturally with developers? We never want to lose that while also um, crafting the best story and, you know, enabling, but crafting the best story in our content and our ads, enabling the sales team, everything from new product introduction to strategic selling on how to sort of communicate the value of that, um, especially in this economy. So I kind of think of marketing is a, you know, a hundred person storytelling unit in many ways. And we just decide on the channel and the budget behind each channel and all of those things. But ultimately it's a story that you tell, maybe two stories that you tell depending on the audience. Um, and everyone needs to tell that story. Yeah, that's great. So what's interesting to you or what's most interesting to you about launch darkly? Um, good question. I mean, I really, I like the developer space. I like technical products. So you know, when I said, what I mean by that is like, you know, you've built a product, a product built by engineers or for engineers or by technical organizations or technical people for technical people. So it's not like you're building something for a CMO, for instance, or a head of sales or a head of finance. Um, those are all certainly viable. I just think there's something very pure about the idea of building something that you, for a, a problem that you saw as an engineer or developer technical team and to solve that problem and take it to market. I think that's really interesting. Um, and so I, I like that piece. Developer marketing um, and technical marketing in general has a certain purity to it. I like, like, you know, you have to really get to the point, um, sort of a low tolerance for BS. Um, but at the same time, I find the technical audiences are still, they're very emotional, they're very reputation driven. So there's a lot of fun things you can still do. Um, I just kind of feel like the signal to noise, um, is high in technical marketing. I like that. Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about how you, uh, got to where you're at right now? Me personally, or us as a company? Or yeah. Anyways? Interpret that however you will. But, um, personally, I think is super interesting to learn more about, um, you and your, your career history trajectory and so forth. Yeah. Um, I'm a little bit of an accidental CMO. I always say. Um, I, you know, I, I went to, uh, university of South Carolina, which is known oftentimes as the Harvard of the South, mm -hmm. um, may not have known that, but now you do, um, with its 105% acceptance rate, yeah, it's like, yeah. it's just like, we're just, <laughs> anyone gets in, um, they're like, can you do 105%? I'm like, you can there, but anyways, um, but I graduated and honestly the, with a marketing degree, but my first job out of college was as a developer. I, taught myself how to code um, many years ago. And I was a terrible, like the most average at best uh, C developer. Um, but what I but found you're, was you're like, outstanding on the custom MySpace huge. Uh, pages, right? Still, still am I'm bringing it back. That's the next, it's the next Twitter. Um, the, um, so what I learned though, pretty early in my career was that like, Hey, like if you understand the technology, as a business person, that's a huge advantage. And so my career quickly kind of became like, okay, like maybe we shouldn't have him writing code, <laughs> but to like, Hey, like he seems like a good person to live between the business side and the technical side. Um, and I started my career at Pricewaterhouse 
And then I went on and I got stuck at the time in what was becoming CRM. So it was Salesforce automation was becoming customer relationship management. This is pre Salesforce, pre cloud. Um, but then I ended up going to Siebel at the, which at the time was the market leader in sort of Salesforce automation and becoming CRM. And, and really it's the company that Salesforce replaced, um, nice work Salesforce, but, um, that kind of like being able to understand those two things and understand, you know, the technical side, the business side, understanding the sales side, that was kind of where I lived. I lived somewhere between consulting and sales for a long time. Um, then I ended up in a sales management role, had like a team of five, um, which was a weird turn. And then, um, I had a weird stop in a, the wine business, which we can talk about at some point. Um, but I ended up back in enterprise software, um, kind of in product marketing, somewhere between sales and marketing. Uh, so I've always kind of lived in between. Like that was always the piece I liked was like, I didn't really want to be the reason I didn't like sales because you're just kind of in sales. But these other things is like, hey, I get to be in, I'm in the sales meetings and I'm in the marketing meetings and I'm in the product meetings. And I liked the problem solving aspect of that. I thought was sort of interesting. Um, and so then I left a company called Success Factors where I was technically in marketing, but again, spent all, most of my time in sales and ended up at a startup called Get Satisfaction back in the day. And GetSat was where we met um, forever ago. And GetSat was a, a really like a really important startup in the early days of sort of Web 2.0 and social web and um, very influential, even though it wasn't the, the big winner in terms of outcome. It certainly kind of wagged the dog for a long time around what was possible. Um, I started there in BD because I was like, oh, I'm biz dev, I'll be all, and I ended up as the head of marketing and I've been in that role, CMO, uh, head of marketing for 12, 13 years now, at various stages of startup. So that's kind of how I got there. I, I ended up in marketing, honestly, because I just didn't think many people were doing it very well at the time. <laughs> and I was like, hey, it's another problem to solve and it lives in between a lot of things. And that's kind of how I, I just sort of shot my shot and ended up in the seat and so far so good. So obviously you've been around for a while, um, doing marketing at various companies. Huh, age joke, um, fun. Yeah. I'm <laughs> sorry. I, I had to, um, <laughs> uh, so you've seen a lot of change. Obviously you mentioned web 2.0 yep. a while ago, but how have the last couple of years specifically changed kind of everything for, for our world, for our space? Um, I think that there's never been, better data for b2b like b2c marketing i mean they have tons of pos data you know what i mean like they live in data you go to procter and gamble there's just thousands of people doing market research and reading through nielsen reports and all of that but in b2b you've oftentimes you're working with a lot less data and so i think first and foremost in the past however many years is we've had we've got more and better data for b2b marketing than ever before I mean, attribution can be weird, but I think like more that it's more than directional and it's, you, you can show up in conversations now with sort of empirical data versus like a hunch. Now, I mean, I like a hunch, but I prefer one backed by data. So I think that's been really helpful. Um, I think that there's been a sort of general acceptance that the way people buy software has changed. And so oftentimes um, they've done tons of research. They've interacted with marketing in a million different ways. They've watched your YouTube demos. They've watched things on the site, like ever before they want to talk to a salesperson um, that used to be not as generally accepted. So there's like, there is this sort of journey that people go. It involves uh, many, many different touches, oftentimes many people in many different channels even before they decide to actually formally engage with the company. So I think that's been a real help. Data supports that argument. Um, and I also think that like, I think that B2B marketing is definitely like, doesn't take itself as seriously as it used to. That I mean, when I first got into this, it was like, there was this hard line. I've, I've talked about it a lot of times, um, but like consumer marketing was this wildly emotional thing. And, B2B marketing was this wildly logical thing. And, um, but then you would sort of get under the covers of that and you'd be like, well, I mean, people make all sorts of emotional decisions when they're buying email software, 
Like, you know what I mean? Like MailChimp was never like, look how logical this request is. It's like, Ooh, there's a monkey. I like monkeys. Like, <laughs> um, and they backed it up with the other things, but it was, it was very Zendesk, early Zendesk. These were very sort of like consumer, like brand experiences. And I thought that was really interesting was this idea that like, even when people are buying, I mean, oftentimes there's nothing more personal or emotional than your career. So a lot of times a, a, something you're buying for work is a reflection of like your job, your career. I want to advance myself. You know, I'm buying launch darkly because I'm a dev manager who wants to be a director. I want to run platform. And I feel like this is a, a piece of software that my team can work with to help me advance the cause of the business and therefore my career. That's actually pretty emotional. Actually, there's nothing logical about that. I think that, um, I think that people accepting that piece has been sort of interesting and we've seen a lot better B2B marketing because of it. B2B marketing used to be pretty terrible. Yeah. As you can what, attest. What's a MailChimp monkey's name? He's got a name. Bob. Bob the monkey. <laughs> yeah. So you're, so what you're saying is a lot of people saw Bob the monkey and they're like, that guy can help mm -hmm. me with my career. I yeah. I mean, his name's uh, Bob. Yeah. No, I, I, I also think, so let me give you the other, I thought that the other thing that came out of this and MailChimp's a good example. Yeah. Um, people started, um, UX started mattering. I actually think product design started mattering in a pretty interesting way. So a lot of times when you look at, and, and it, if done well, then it sort of integrates very nicely into your marketing and branding and demand and product marketing and all that. Um, MailChimp's a good example of that. Like the, the experience itself was like really well done, really well designed. And then, you know, it's really hard to have like this really savvy, Oh my God, our marketing design team is world-class. And then you get into a product that looks like it's built in 1975. That's a weird experience. Or we have this really sexy product and we have Oracle 1982 marketing. You know what I mean? So I actually think that product design has made a huge uh, change in how people think about software as well. Thank you, Greg. But Keith, you mentioned uh, that, that you think of marketing essentially as a hundred person storytelling yeah. uh, team. That and that term gets thrown around a lot, right? I mean, we are part of the throwing Best community. Story wins, guys. You yeah. should name the podcast that. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we might make sure yeah. to get the royalty check too. It's a free idea. <laughs> but what? How would you define? How would you define what it is, but also like what is not storytelling? Yeah, <clears throat> I don't think of storytelling when you say. I hate that. I almost avoided that because you know people go the wrong direction. It's like you know. Oh, they're telling some, like, you know, like some imaginary world, like a tale. It's like, you know, the words matter more than anything else. Like, you know, it like, doesn't matter if the product sucks. You just message your way around it. Like, I don't believe that. When I say story is that like, um, basically, I just sort of think of like the audience backwards and where they are in sort of the decision making process. So like, if, um, if it's like someone who hasn't interacted with the company yet, like that's a very different story than someone who's really considering a purchase. Um, so you start there and, you know, at the very top of the funnel, like the thing, it, it would be like, if you're telling a, a, you know, you're telling a joke to your friend versus you're telling a joke to your kid, like, you know, now Jason would tell the dirty joke unedited, but civilized folks like Josh and myself would, we would edit the one for the child, you know? Um, and so, um, because, you know, Jason, it's Jason. Um, so, um. And so I think of that's no different. Like, so if you're talking to a, the C level, that's one story. If you're talking to a developer, that's another story. If you're talking to someone who's never heard of you, that's a very specific story. If they haven't heard of you and they're in financial services, well, hell, that's a different story because you, how you would tell that story, you would want to make it very specific to them. And then all the way down to like, they're at the last mile of considering you. What does that story look like? Well, that story might be told by your customers. So you, this is when you have testimonials this is when you have, uh, sort of later funnel content to sort of get them over the line. Like you've emotionally hooked them and now it needs to be really logical, right? They need to feel like that 95% of emotion is not going to be enough for them to make the decision. They have to say like, no, I checked all the logical boxes, checks out. References are clean. ROI is good. Like that's the, that's how people think. Um, and so if you think of it just as one big story that you tell different ways, depending on the audience, then 
it really makes sense. It makes sense. It's in your deck that the sales team uses is in the words that come out of their mouth. It's in your paid ads. It's in the blog posts that you're trying to get to index organically. It's what your booth says about you at a- at AWS or KubeCon or whatever it is. Um, it's what's on your website. It's, you know, how you handle that same story in EMEA or APAC. Like, you know, it's, it's just one big story is the way I think of it. And then the rest is really just channel mix budgets and kind of like where you are in the funnel. How do you think about that overall system, right? You mentioned, or you touched on basically tailoring it, segmenting it, uh, and feel free to share this about, you don't have to speak theoretically, like what's, what's the story for launch darkly at the highest level? Yeah. So we, so the first thing we do is like, we, we have the story, but we, we work our way back from, uh, you know, an ICP ideal customer profile. Like that's really important. So we make sure that, you know, we know who we're targeting and that the story makes sense to that group. Um, at its core and the story evolves, right? The story evolves as you add more product, the story evolves as more people use your software, all of these things. But the story at its core was, um, launch darkly feature management is effectively control points in your code. And it, it, like in the le- the most boring way ever for this conversation, it separates release and deploy. Like that's the core thing. So basically um, I'm building software. I've got a bunch of features that I'm releasing. I've got a bunch of f- features in the product and we can basically put like an on off switch on any one of those. So um, at the simplest version of this is you release new software and um, things go poorly instead of going back and doing a rollback, which is what you usually have to do. You just basically go in and you hit the button, we call them toggles, and you toggle that feature off or whatever's causing the bug and you sort of quietly pretend it didn't happen and you go fix it and turn it back on. I mean, that's it. Now, when you have those control points, you can do all sorts of things. You can say like, hey, like I can determine who's going to see this. I can have one version of the product, but I only want 20% of my audience to see this version because I want to see what happens. Like I want to see how they interact with it. We want to, um, you know, we don't want to release it to GA because we want to make sure there nothing goes wrong. So when you have the control points, it's more than just you. First, you have this like on off switch, which is like a control thing. Um, and then you have this like on off switch that determines like who's actually seeing this. So now I have control plus I have extreme targeting. And then now based on all that information, I can decide how to release who I'm going to release this to when all of those things. If I'm a big company decisions like this become like one of governance. So like I have a big DevOps team, let's say I'm a big uh, financial services. So then there's all sorts of workflows that would be associated with releasing software that launch darkly would also have. Um, there's a lot of exhaust data wise that I would want to put into my snowflake instance or to data dog or whatever, um, and analyze what's happening. So, but at its core, the value prop is this, um, it's, you can move faster, um, with confidence. I mean, it's really it. Like you people are, you know, it's used to be, you know, there was the whole, like every company is a software company and that was a, oh, so provocative. Now no one, I mean, everyone just assumes that's true, but like, let's be honest, not all software companies are created equally. Like they're not all Facebook and Google. They're, they're your real estate agent. <laughs> they're, they're their restaurant who's trying to do their own delivery or web ordering or whatever. Or, um, so um, you know, there's a reason why people build software in the first place. It's not just for the hell of it. They're trying to get more customers or make their current customers happy or spend more money or increase efficiency or whatever it may be. Um, and there's a whole, like speed is how you innovate. Let's, I mean, you, there is like this thing, this sort of, um, you know, dark force running behind you, like just basically saying you have to innovate or you die if you're a company. Um, so if you, but speed feels risky. So if you go too fast, that feels really risky. Are we, we're going to break something, you know, we're going to have a Southwest airline moment where they're soft, you know, everyone's camped out in, in a, uh, in an airport, or if you go too slow, the risk is like, well, someone's going to lap us. We're not moving fast enough. So there's like risk either way. And at its core launch darkly basically removes that risk. So it allows people to move faster without, with the confidence of not worried about breaking things. That's the core value problem. There's a million things on top of that, but that is the story. And then you have to evolve that story into like, okay, well, why does that matter from a business standpoint? 
Like, why, why would I care if I'm the CEO of a company about this, this software company that my developers decided to use or DevOps or whatever it is? Well, it's because like all of those reasons that you were, you were doing innovation anyway, digital experiences, whatever we want to call it, like those are all business reasons. And, you know, LaunchDarkly helps facilitate the outcome you want. That's the, so then you start shifting from like very much, which is like a dev centric thing. The message was like, Hey, you can ship on nights and have your weekend Friday night and have your weekend back. That was the message for the like end user. And that worked really well. And then you start moving your way upstream with a different message and then you get all the way up and you're just talking about business value. Right. And that's, that's super helpful. I like the way you think about that entire system and use like everyday language that you were talking earlier about kind of how the, yeah, the world of B2C has influenced B2B. Yep. Um, like I like how you're just talking to people and thinking about it that way. Everyone always says, you know, we're just speaking, speak like humans, you know, and then right. write kind of a, sometimes write a corporate robotic speak with, well, with your company, s- companies are just the groups of people. Like they're not yeah. like the, it's, it's a, it's, it's an inanimate object. I mean, you know what I mean? Like it's just, so ultimately you're talking to people or people, persons in a room or on a call or at an event or whatever it is. And they're just people, you know, so they, they buy deodorant. They, you know, they buy, they get inundated with 50,000 emails every day from everything from Patagonia to an email marketing software company. You know what I mean? Like, um, they have the full range of experiences. They're not just that logical. Um, you know, there was something that I have always thought is like, there was always this weird divide of like, Hey, people go to work and from nine to five, they're really logical. But then magically at 501 and from five to nine, they're wildly (laughs) emotional and there's binging Netflix. Um, and the reality is, is that they're pretty much the same person the whole day. Um, you just, they interact differently with different content. Yeah. And you, and you mentioned the example of, you know, ship on a Friday night and and have your weekend back without worrying about something blowing up. Uh, have you, and you mentioned that was working. How, how have you heard from people, you know, you, you were talking earlier about validation and even attribution. How, how have you gauged that, that, that your messages and your story is actually resonating with people? Um, we ask, I mean, one is like financial results. He's like, Oh, something's going, something's going well here. Um, but then you just, we talk to customers and I, I, you know, I, I would, especially when I first started, um, I was, you know, talk to customers, listen to, still do. We still listen to a lot of, um, gong recordings or core, it was chorus gong, um, recordings. I would try to understand what people are saying, but I would just ask and say like, what's the value here? And, and I got, what I, what I figured out when I first got to launch darkly was this is, um, the, the business itself is fueled by like a lot of emotion, even though you wouldn't think it. And it was like, Hey, like launch darkly has changed my team's quality of life. Um, it would seriously, people would say things like that thing. I used to worry about, we used to worry about shipping. There's some anxiety every time you ship. And especially if you're shipping anywhere near the weekend or who's got the pager that weekend. And you know, all of that went away. Like, so I don't worry about that thing anymore. That's, there's nothing logical about those statements. Get your night and weekends back is an emotional thing. It's like, do, do you want to work this weekend? No, good. You know, and so that worked and I liked the emotional hook of it. Um, but it wasn't, people weren't quantifying. Now, that made me a little nervous. It's like, well, how do you measure that? And it's like, people are happier. And I was like, okay, well, how do you measure that? And it was, and so then what we did from that is like, Hey, how do we start quantifying this better? Like, because we know that there's real value here. When people say your software changed our quality of life, that's in a real quote. Like I never said that about Marketo shout out to Marketo, wherever you are. Um, you know what I mean? Like no one said, wow, that that cookie tracking really changed everything. Um, you know, um, but people, it really is like a quality of life thing. We love that. But then it was like, well, how do we get this quantified? And then it was like, we started moving to more metric driven things. We don't want to lose the emotional hook because I think that's really important, but we wanted to help them quantify um, what this looks like in terms of value. Cause that's honestly what they wanted as well. It was like, Hey, like I get my nights and weekends back, but I, I wish my boss's boss's boss knew how great we were doing or something like that. I just, I just want to say that I, 
I don't endorse your perspective on Marketo, just in case anyone from Marketo is listening, but everything else was just great. On the, on the, you're touching on something that I think is really interesting with the, like you're essentially met wanting to measure the impact on a qualitative thing, like, which is really in the realm of brand, right? Like what's their brand experience and, and what would they say about you if you weren't in the room? How, how do you balance or you, you seem like a very, you're very wired towards measuring. How do you make the connection there on, or do you spend time and try to, with any amount of precision, look at the impact of that strong brand experience on the business so that you can see like, oh, here's the actual impact of the direct impact of having a good story on our business results? Yeah, so we do um, we do a lot of win loss reporting, and sort of put that in place very early, um, and so we you know we pay an outside company; they do a great job, um, and so we get win loss reports all the time. And the wins are um, what I found very early on in that first year was like I would sort of sur- like you know they they would summarize them for us, but then I would kind of go through and circle things and. You know, a lot of the wins were like trust. That's a brand, by the way. It was sort of security, like not data security, but like this also brand. Um, a lot of like we just acknowledged that um, we looked at every vendor and um, acknowledged that you have the best reputation. Like the word reputation would be in- included a lot. That's very brand. You know, if we think about it, like none of these things have anything to do with like the technical capability of the product. This is all about like we've, uh, you know, both successfully communicated and the built a product that, um, people talk about people are hearing from their peers and great reputation, trust, security. Um, these were all brand elements. So we liked that, um, a lot. And that, that was sort of, okay. It's like, so the story we're telling is resonating. And then there were of course, like very technical reasons we win because we have a great product team and, um, the architecture and how you build a product when you're selling to a technical audience is very important. Um, cause you know, if back to Marketo, but like, it's not like you, the three of us would get under the hood of Marketo and see like, Hmm, I wonder how they built this. Oh, that's interesting. I would, I would have chosen a different path. Um, but with, (laughs) with, um, you know, launched Arkley, that is the scrutiny we were under from our, from our users, especially. So, um, that's really important. But what I, what I landed on was like, wow, this, this company has, um, a really successful brand in this space. That's awesome. Um, so you mentioned earlier that you oversee a group of about a hundred people as a CMO. What's something that you still really enjoy getting in the weeds on? Um, nothing. No, I'm just kidding. Um, (laughs) from a marketing. So, you know, I always think of CMO as like, a. I mean, it's really somewhere between a strategy and operations job has always been my take. Like, I think it's the chief marketer, but like marketing shouldn't live in some silo. So, I mean, I, I really oddly enough, enjoy like financial modeling. I enjoy that part of the process, like trying to like, you know, bottoms up a business, um, for planning that makes me a psycho, but it's quite true. Um, from a core marketing standpoint, I love, I love product marketing. I love positioning. I love that, you know, the, that's story development. Um, that's where that lives in the, in the org. So I, you know, I like thinking through what's the next verse person or version of our pitch or the vision. Um, you know, I like, how do we enable the sales team to tell that story? Like that's the piece. I do really love that. Um, but I try at this stage and this size, like, I try really hard and it is really hard by the way, to not be destructive, you know, and like, so sometimes I'll like write, you know, I'll, I'll write like someone on the product marketing team or the head of product marketing here, I'll be like, Hey, let's catch up for a few. And I can just see the like dread, like in their response, like everything. Okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Cause they're just like, Oh, he's going to come in and have an opinion on this <laughs> and it's destructive. So I try really hard, uh, scale, like, what I've done is basically said like, here's the things that I have to be included on. I've made it very clear. And I think that's something you have to do with this uh, size of team anyway, but it's hard, but I really do like the positioning work, the messaging sales enablement. That's a lot of fun. 
that is the story that gets told. So, yeah, I absolutely agree. Yeah, me too. Um, conversely, what are some things that you just don't enjoy about marketing? Um, or maybe another way of framing that question, if you'd rather answer it this way, um, what are some things that you all kind of look at in the world of marketing as just sort of a waste of time? That's a good question. I mean, we don't have a mascot yet. We do have a mascot. Let me lie, but we don't have a live one yet. So maybe maybe that's a step on some, something we haven't done yet. Um I don't think of anything as like necessarily way. I can't think of anything that comes to mind. That's a waste of time. I mean, I, I think we're very respectful of our audience's time. I mean, y'all have known me long enough. Like I, I, I really hate things that are like, you know, what, you know, what the Oscars can teach you about account-based marketing, you know, like that. I would just, I just like, I'm like, damn you LinkedIn. How did we let this exist for so long? Um, that really, really is not, not good for me. Um, but I think like, I don't think there's anything we think is just not on the table. It's just a matter of volume. Like I think of it as like, it's, it's like a mixing board in a recording studio. You're just like some things you've got turned up really high. And then, you know, your cousin who's playing the triangle, who's just there because your aunt made you, you've got that on zero and you know, he's banging the shit out of that triangle, but it'll never make it into the mix. Um, that's kind of how I feel about it all is like some things just higher, have higher volume. Um, I don't, you know, like, listen, there's things you, you marketing is, is a very like wide ranging function. I mean, you have everything from like very strategic message that you're telling to like, how do we successfully execute like a VIP event in Austin, Texas? Like, you know, that's pretty broad, um, paid ads, paid social SEO, email marketing, like all of these things. Um, so there's definitely things that I would not hire myself to do for sure. Um, I would never hire myself as the head of demand, you know, because like my brain doesn't think that way versus being the head of product marketing. You know, I wouldn't hire myself to be the head of corporate marketing because my brain doesn't, you know, so I think sort of a, acknowledging what you're good at and hiring for the rest is a good life lesson. Yeah, absolutely. So, so you mentioned earlier, Apologies to any triangle players out there. You're all, you're all <laughs> lovely. Every instrument in the orchestra counts. So go ahead. It sounds like that could be more specific to your cousin. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. The Bob, who's also the male, male chimp monkey. So <laughs> Sorry, Bob. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Freddie. The, you, you mentioned the economy earlier and it's certainly, I, I feel like it's for most people, it's just a bit of a, question mark a little bit of uncertainty yep um what what do you think with the with things shifting what does that mean for brand people and marketers in general um i mean i definitely think of like you know the economic buyer in any deal of any significant size you should just approach it as that's probably the cfo like you know that's probably over the top a little hyperbole but like and, but someone in finance or procurement is going to be the last mile of your purchase again of any size. Um, and so you, and they usually, that person doesn't care what your product technically does. Like they don't like they, you're going to have to speak to them in terms of why this is really important to the business and why with a fixed budget, this is the thing they need to commit X number of dollars to versus that other thing. And in, in the tight economy, you know, in a, in a sort of a bull market, you're competing against named competitors or you're competing against, um, build versus buy or whatever it is. Right. But in a tight market, you're competing against an alternate use of funds. So you, you not only have to win the like competitive piece, you then have to convince them that your dollars are worth more than Marketo. Sorry, Marketo, but why not? Um, that's that's the thing that has changed right now and so you you really do have to um be prepared for that last mile and you have to start that early because a lot of times you're not in the room when that conversation happens it's the people you're selling to the people are like yeah we love launch darkly we're gonna do this and then they have to go communicate in that last mile oftentimes you don't get a, a seat at that table and if they screw that up you don't get a second shot so you have to start preparing the buyer and the buying syndicate earlier on what that last mile of procurement or finance is going to care about. Interesting. So you, how, how do you frame that 
for launch darkly to the CFO. Um, or you know, to for arm us, it the really, buyer to talk to yeah, their CFO. We've actually, we just started for everything that there's a developer or like I'm calling a developer benefit, not like the individual necessarily, but like for your development needs, right? Um, every place there's an obvious benefit to that process we map to an obvious business benefit for the company so that it's, you know, it's very linear. It's just like you, you do X, you get Y, you do Z, you get A, you do B, you get C. Um, And we start that very early in the process, which traditionally like really wasn't the case. People are like, they know us, they want, Ultimately, they're they, a lot of times they come, they've done their research, they've come inbound, they're, they're, you know, I'm not saying it's transacting ready to buy, but like they are inclined to use our software. You know, what I mean, there's still work that has to be done by the sales team and the SE team and demos and all this stuff. Um, but like, that's largely a technical and product discussion historically. And now it's just got to be like all of those things plus and the plus has to be something that um, is business value related, something that's going to get it over the last mile. And so you have, you have marketing and, uh, the SDRs in BDRs in in your org, the, yep. what do you, how do you think about enabling them? Or I guess actually your account executives to what, what do you think is marketing's role in equipping them to make that business case? Yeah. I mean, one is you need really good product marketing. Um, who can, you know, who understands the customer and understands the buyer really well. And again, the buyer, so the, you know, product marketing has to go and make sure that they understand, um, you know, you can't abandon your core story because then you don't even get to the last mile. So this is additive. You have to keep what's working and then you have to add something to it. And then they have to, you know, here we have a sales enablement team that does a good job sort of program management. So they, you know, product marketing and sales enablement work on certifying the reps on these stories, um, this messaging. And it's really just a repetition. I mean, honestly, it's, it's great sales managers, great sales leaders. This is what they do. They just, you know, I have a huge amount of respect for our, our revenue leadership team because it's just the repetition of like, consistency, 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 every time, every place, um, making sure you understand the message, understand you're conversational about it. So we're an input to that process, but ultimately um, it, you know, it's product marketing and sales enablement. And then it's a ton of reinforcement from sales leadership. I mean, ultimately like think of it as like a training event or just teaching your kids something like, you know, telling them to do something, Hey, you need to do that instead of this. And then walking away rarely works long term. <laughs> it might work in that one moment, but um, but it, it's reinforcement that gets the message across over time. So it's a it's not purely a marketing; it's a team sport, and ultimately it comes down to revenue leaders be reinforcing the message. That's really helpful. Are are there when when s- some people think about the like a tight economy, they think of it as the time to, you know, either double down on a direction or potentially, uh, you know, pivot or there's more, maybe more time to focus on innovating. How are, how are you all responding to the market conditions? So for, for us, I mean, I I think there's some universal truths right now in tech. Um, I, I, I'm the one being interviewed, so I get to say that it's a universal truth. The next guest can say what they want. Um, so the bottom of the market right now is challenging. So SMBs, um, you know, reasons are pretty simple. We've come out of a like a long period of um, easy access to cheap capital, lots of funding. You can easily get from your Series A to your Series B to your Series C. Um, you can get it pretty cheap in terms of what it's costing you on your cap table, whatever it is. And that motion has, you know, a lot of that money gets spit on technology. So it's like, you know, you raise money, you hire a team, you're buying technology, you're buying launch darkly, you're buying an email marketing solution, you're buying whatever, you're buying data dog, all of these things. Um, When that capital goes away, the bottom of the market, um, and, and the, the one, the sort of through line there is that like, unless you're just totally, it's not going anywhere. There's more capital when you need it. So you're, you're just, 
let's spend, let's aggressively grow, aggressively grow. We'll get to the next stage. We'll go get more money. We'll keep going. Well, that capital now is really hard to get. So that means that they're spending very differently because now you're trying to cash equals time in a startup. Um, and if you don't have cash, you don't have time. So the bottom of the market is sort of universally challenged right now, uh, still active, but much smaller deals. So one of the reasons I liked to launch darkly when I got here is launch darkly knew how to sell to the to SMBs to startups and knew how to sell to large investment banks and brokerage houses and insurance companies and regulated industries like they the company really had a lot of success in enterprise as well and I thought that was really unique given how early it was so for us the demand in enterprise is incredibly strong. The demand downstream is still incredibly strong. We just expect it to yield less just because people will buy less. They're just being a little more conservative downstream. So we, we have a, a baked in advantage to not like what you see right now in a lot of startups is they're like, you know, you know, shit, I've got to go figure out how to sell to the enterprise all of a sudden. And it's not, it's just cause we need bigger deals and they're still spending money. And it's really hard to do that when you need to do it like existentially. Um, so for us, we still have, um, it really hasn't hit us, rocked us as hard as a lot of people because we weren't so single threaded on uh, small tech companies buying our software. So how do we approach it? It's like, be smart. You know what I mean? Like we're, we're not just setting money on fire as an art project right now. We're not, you know, I, I think it becomes more of a, like an operations and finance approach. Um, and then continue to go where people are buying. Like, it's just that simple. Like, you know, like I said, I don't, I think it's going to be really hard to get venture back companies to spend a lot of money right now. So I don't think that's a fight worth fighting. So you talked about money essentially becoming more expensive now, harder to come by. Um, we also talked a little bit earlier about how marketing is sort of a soundboard, right? And you're kind of making adjustments as you go. Yeah. What do you think with, um, the current marketing conditions being what they are? Do you think it's going to result in a change in terms of what people are doing more of versus what they're doing less of? Like, are people going to be doing more written content versus less TikTok or maybe are they doing right, right. that differently? Uh, that's a really good question. I think that like, I mean, I definitely think people are, they're definitely focusing on performance channels right now. Mm -hmm. um, and there's probably a trade off to that in terms of awareness, depending on where you are and you know how much awareness you have. Um, but it's probably a necessary one in order to keep, keep things going. So sure. I definitely think people are like trying to drive more performance marketing stuff probably earlier than they should in some cases. So, I mean, it, it, you know, it's like, Hey, like I don't have time to nurture those 10,000 leads to health over the next six months. Like we gotta, we gotta try and short circuit that process. So I think that's a likely outcome of this. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, probably not. And that back to, I mean, you know, like probably not a lot of billboard spending right now by the startup community, like things like that. Radio ads might not be. I mean, I guess yeah. it depends on how performance driven they are. But um, those are the places like the the real sort of like I won't call it as an extravagance because I actually think they matter. Mm -hmm. um, I just think those are the things that are the hardest to measure and the things that are hardest to measure are going to be the easiest to, to cut or dial down right now. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So if you only had one channel, just speaking purely hypothetically here, if you only had one channel, one content type you could produce, what would that be right now? I mean, ultimately like your dream is to, it's findability. Like your dream is the website. Your dream is a website that indexes and like you've nailed every single, you know, when someone's searching feature management react or feature, you know, like they just land on your site. Cause they've, They've already, they've told you what they care about. You have not spent an actual ad dollar to get them there. I mean, that's the dream. Um, that dream is never fully realized, obviously, um, because you end up, you need other channels unless you're, you know, I mean, you know, I, I think like Canva was built on a lot of really impressive SEO chops. Like that was like, I think that was the dream. Um, so if I could just make everything inbound, um, content wise via videos and, and, you know, written content, and that would be the dream. Um, that's not how it ends up working out, but that would be ultimately, um, cause that's just the most efficient version of marketing right there. 
do you so it's it's probably not a secret at this point but you're you're a pretty funny person right would you agree um i would agree no, i don't <laughs> what um, do you think jake i i, I like when i laugh. think of the when i think of you know even working with you in the past it was it was always like doing things kind of unexpectedly you know and not I don't think saying like not taking yourself too seriously is the right way to, to say it. Um, but you know, just like it, I, I've always kind of liked your disdain, I guess, for doing things exactly the way everyone else does them. Um, but like what, what in your current business, what do you think is, is, is there a place for humor in the world still? The economy's definitely made me ask that to some degree. I'm like, oh, is this now the time for like some, like, like I know your budget are being cut, skadoosh, ha ha. You know what I mean? Like I'm trying to like figure that one out. Um, yeah, I mean, I I think like here's my take. I I this isn't medical research. I mean, at the end of the day, like you know, so one, I think like there's a level of seriousness in the world that's appropriate and the level of seriousness that's not. So I, I mean that we're not that, um, two is I think that left like unchecked, then all like you run into a situation where like you just, everyone says the same thing, you know, design trends, they all look the same. Do you remember when like one medical did their, like the, you know, in every billboard, suddenly every company sort of looked like one medical, the font was the same, the same colors. There's like, you know, people shot on a pastel background, there's, you know what I mean? Like, and you're like, wait a second, is that the one medical? No, no, that's a email marketing. Oh no, that's finance software. Like the, you, there's these trends that just naturally happen in design and content and tone. Um, and if you don't try and break that, then it's really hard to tell from company to company to company. And I'm talking like not even competitive. I'm talking just like in the world of software. Um, and like, you know, like, it's like um a good example is like trip actions like that rebrand to nirvana i think which is my favorite bottled water by the way big fan uh, straight from the source um you know and then like the visuals there like not not like the visuals there like i'm like huh that's you know interesting sort of feels like i'm not exactly sure what's going, but i'm like i feel like i've seen it before i actually think that that happens very naturally and so my take has always been like, what can we do that feels unique? And a lot of times it's trying to, you know, an approach at humor. Humor works when it works. Humor is hard because it's obviously subjective. Um, so a lot of times, whether it's a funny video or a funny email or whatever, like it's engaging. It forces people to have an opinion, like ideally positive um, versus a lot of times just like, Who's like reading your web copy, just your like basic web copy and be like, Ooh, I'm inspired. Right. And, you know, so you try and balance that. I, I don't think you can just be all, all like humor all the time. Cause I do think you run the risk of not feeling serious. Like, is this a serious business or are they just goofing off? But I do think it's a great way to engage people, especially if you understand the audience. So you, you know, when you can, when you can do something that's like an inside joke that your audience understands. I think that's a risk worth taking. And that's something we've always played around with for as long as I can remember being in this role. Um, and for the most part, it's worked really well. I mean, we've, you know, we've done videos together that got ridiculous, like outsized returns relative to the cost, like in terms of awareness, um, sort of people discussing. So something user generated, like it's a, it's a great medium. If you're willing to take a chance, I think it's a really, not so great medium when you're like, I just want to do what those other 10 companies did. Um, we just had this conversation today with our creative director. Like I really hate customer testimonial videos. Like they're just terrible. Like it's the, do you remember when the fire fire festival um, was around and then someone did the fire festival video just from stock images, you know what I mean? Like stock video. And it's just like a video of like someone on a boat and then the boats going through the water and it was the same exact talk track as, but they did it for like $15. And at the time, if you remember, they had spent like millions of dollars on this hype video and someone basically built the same video for 15 bucks on uh, whatever stockphotos.com or something. Um, 
that's um that's how i feel about testimonial videos you have like really terrible music you have a b-roll of like people working they're ty- someone's typing oh there's work happening i'm in an office and it slides from right to left sometimes it slides from right you know left to right and you've got a video team who's got like a canon dslr on a track and they're pushing it like they're scorsese like you know what i mean and you know and then the person cuts to the person and they're shot on a very specific angle lit the same way and they say like you know i use launch darkly because you know what i mean and they're reading off a script and it's like you could just you could do that for any company it's the same exact thing and so i asked our creative director like hey like th- could we just make them not suck like i'm not asking it to be like but just what if we just decided not to do that what if we started with the premise of that approach is off the table and we're about to release a series that's like it has a host it's sort of funny and interesting and engaging it uses a lot of like interactive elements to it um it's it's like it's sort of like i just basically said like what if we built a a testimonial video that didn't suck um and i like any the ideas were like should it be like the dating game should we do like three customers at once and ask them random questions like we were open to anything and so i think like where we landed was like this really high fidelity sort of engaging video and like but we didn't have to do that like honestly the expectation is the slide the canon from left to right slide it from right to left and show the people talking hey i'm talking to you look at us we're in a video this means we're working and the person's going to know oh this is this is work this is a work video you know we're not throwing the football so they don't think it's a football video you know like that and and just saying like we could have done that. No one would have cared. No one would have said, man, I wish launch darkly didn't do that same video that everyone else does. But now we have an opportunity. People to say like, Oh, this is really good. It's engaging. I'm actually going to watch it. And so that to me is when you're trying to break the like monotony of like B2B marketing It's just, everyone does the same thing if left unchecked. And so you have to actively start with like, let's not do that and see where you land. And sometimes the, Sometimes you're like, hey, we're just not going to innovate on this pricing page. <laughs> it's just like, just give them three options, have a contact enterprise and keep moving. But some places you can. Yeah. Well, Keith, it's been, uh, it's been great connecting with you. And um, it's always a joy to, to get, get some time together. Um, we're at time, unfortunately. But uh, wow. for people, I know, right? It seems it's a like joy a for joy. me as well. Yeah, a real joy. Um, if people want to follow along, People want to find out more about you and uh, just yeah follow you for the journey. Um, what's the best place? TikTok, uh, Instagram. Um, I'm, I'm big on I'm big on the TikTok. It's, <laughs> yeah. uh, it's dancing. Jason Jason at column five dot com. <laughs> um, the no um, yeah just hit me on LinkedIn. I will check it twice a year. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Column five's best story wins is for marketing and branding professionals looking to unlock their growth potential. Each episode features a conversation with industry leaders about how they win the hearts and minds of their customers and build world-class brands. You'll learn about their success stories and their failures, as well as ideas for how to take your own marketing efforts to the next level. Welcome to Best Story Wins.